Theater presents Rosalind Russell and Vincent Price. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Where There's a Will, starring Vincent Price. And now here is your hostess, Rosalind Russell. Thank you, Larry Chatterton. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theatre urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Where There's a Will, starring Vincent Price as Edward. Let's see now, the coffee and the brandy, mm, the senator's favorite, and put them down by the easy chair next to the fireplace, so the old windbag will get sleepy faster. And now, where is that list of numbers? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Next, we pull back the tapestry, and so to work. 44 to the right, 16 to the left. Now, 10 more possibilities, starting with 49. Edward, what are you doing? Uh, I was just... Oh, you! Did I scare you? You trying to kill me? What do you think I was doing? Looked like you were trying to open the safe. Don't be insane. I just wanted to make sure it was locked. Oh. If everything is not in order when Senator Winchester opens his safe tonight to read the will, who will hear about it? I don't know. Who? I'll hear about it, my girl. As head of the staff, this safe, along with everything else in Mr. Justin's household, is my responsibility. Mr. Justin, may he rest in peace. Yes, I uh, just wanted to be sure the door hadn't slipped open or something. Uh-huh. We can't be too careful while that emerald is still in there. Oh, that thing, I'll be glad to see it out of the house after tonight. Yeah, so will I. Now put the cream and sugar on that tray and go on about your business. You think it'll go to his nephew, Clarence? Who else? He's the legal heir. Well, what are you gawking at? Mr. Justin's portrait over the fireplace, ain't it lifelike? Mm, disturbingly. Uh, Go on now. When the senator comes in to take his coffee, I don't want him to find you here. Eddie. Hmm? If you was to meet me here about 9.30, we could hold hands in front of the fire, and he most likely wouldn't find us. Forget it. Is that quite clear? Oh, you're the proud one, ain't you? And you're the loud one. Now get out. I'm busy. Officer Hurley asked me again to marry him last night. What do you think of that? Very little. Now go. Go, go, go. Okay, okay, I'm going. 9.30. Out! (laughs) Oh, the things I've had to put up with in this house. That bonehead maid and the countless indignities I... Ah, Senator. Edward, that was a fine dinner. Well, I'll convey that compliment to the cook, sir. I'm stuffed. Oh, here, Senator, sit by the fire. I, I was just preparing your brandy and coffee. Oh, thank you, Edward. You know, as I came in here to the library, I have expected to see Jonathan standing there before the fire. Yes, it's hard to believe he's gone, sir. Always made for it immediately after dinner. Used to say to me, having his little joke, you understand, Hannibal, when I die and old Nick claims me for his own, there's at least one thing I'll be able to count on where he'll take me. And I'd say, what's that, Jonathan? And he'd say, a piping hot dinner. Never had one in this house. (laughs) Then he'd jump up from the table and hurry in here to warm himself. Yes, he was a great joker, sir. Yes, Jonathan Justin was an exacting man, but those of us who knew him best discovered beneath that steel shell of exactitude a heart of gold. Yes, sir. Witness the manner in which his affairs are to be concluded. Uh, Seems a blasphemy to read a man's will on the very day of his funeral, but old Jonathan would have it so. Yes. Uh, more brandy, sir? Uh, no, thank you, Edward. Uh, has Mr. Clarence arrived in town yet, sir? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, legal ethics forbid me to enlarge upon the subject, Edward, but I'm afraid young Clarence is in for a rather unpleasant surprise. Oh? Jonathan didn't care a straw for the boy, you know. Made no secret of it either. Wastrel, he called it. Well, the young man isn't here by 9.45. I have no recourse but open the safe as per Jonathan's instructions and read the will. 9.45? Yes, and uh, you and Rita shall be present as witnesses. Senator, there's 
one thing. Yes, sir. Well, those of us who have been with Mr. Justin the longest, Phillips the gardener and myself... It's been over ten years for you, hasn't it? Uh, closer to twelve, sir. Twelve years? By George, it doesn't seem possible. <laughs> no, sir, it doesn't. Oh, uh, what I was about to ask... Yes. Well, some of us, like Phillips and myself, were wondering if Mr. Justin had... <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> Edward, uh, Mr. Justin was a strange and unpredictable gentleman, and I must admit that what prompted many of his decisions will forever remain a mystery to me. Then you don't know either, sir. In less than half an hour, I will open the safe and read his will. You've all lived in doubt this long. Another 30 minutes can't do much to your nerves. Besides, the disclosures should come directly from Jonathan, in his own words. Uh, just one more thing, sir. Yes. Well, all of us have lived, in a sense, uneasily, sir, ever since Mr. Justin brought the, uh, <laughs> the emerald home from the Orient. He was passionately fond of that stone, Edward. Yes, sir, I know, but we were afraid of its being around. He wouldn't have it insured. I know, he said the appraisers would steal it. Yes, sir, and that made it a double temptation for thieves, knowing that if they took it, no insurance dick <laughs> investigator... <laughs> It would come after them. A man would stop at very little to steal a gem worth... Um... The Cantrelli Emerald cost him $450,000. $450,000, yes. Well, so you see, we were curious as to what disposition Mr. Justin would make of the stone. Uh, perhaps a museum? Perhaps. You'll find out shortly, Edward. Oh, I'll have to get to my feet. Is there anything wrong, sir? Uh, stomach needs sweetening. Oh, I'll get some bicarbonate for you. Sir. Don't bother. I'll get it myself. I think I'll lie down for a bit, Edward. As you wish, sir. I'll be upstairs in my room. Have Rita call me by 9.40 in case I doze off. Certainly, sir. And the old goat swigging down our best brandy. Hmm. And I could do with a bit myself. <laughs> 9.45. Gives me exactly 20 minutes. Should be ample. Well, to success, Edward. To success after 12 years of waiting. <laughs> now to work. Flashlight, bottom drawer of the desk. Then to make sure the hall is empty. Mm -hmm. Very good. Turn off the lights. And now across the room to the safe and... What's that? Someone on the veranda. Trying to get in through the French door, a prowler. He's coming right into this room. A flashlight, making straight for the wall safe. Yes, he pulls back the tapestry. Oh, fat chance he has of opening that safe after I've been trying for 12 years. <laughs> Great Jehoshaphat, he opened it. He's taking out a small black box. He's opening it, playing his light on the contents. It's the emerald. Put up your hands. Uh, uh, take, take it easy, copper. Shut up. Don't turn around. Step off your flashlight and back away from that wall safe. That's enough. Uh, copper, you got me, so don't panic with the heater, huh? Shut up. I never use them myself. What's that over your face, a mask? Uh, just a hanky. Where's the emerald? I got the box right here in my hand. Everything's okay, so we don't panic, huh, copper? Shut up. What are you doing? Opening this French window again. Well, what's the deal? I'm going to give you a break. A break? So don't slow yourself down with a lot of foolish questions. Just toss the box on the sideboard in front of you, then beat it the same way you came in. You want me to leave? You're not deaf. Toss the box on the sideboard and get out. What kind of pinch you call this? Get smart. This is a favor. A pinch will take you ten years. It begins to look like everybody's after this stone, don't it, Buck? Listen, you bonehead. Who's that? Keep your voice down. I'll turn on the lights. What am I going to do? Pull that tapestry back over the face of the safe. Yeah, I got it. What's that document on the floor? Well, I don't know. It fell out of the safe. Give it to me. Yeah, here. Right with you. What about me? Get behind those portiers in front of the French window. Okay, okay. Eddie, I knew you'd be here. What do you want? Oh, you're the spoofer, aren't you? What? I thought you weren't going to meet me here at 9.30. I am not meeting you here. Can't you get that through your thick head? I just happen to be here. Now beat it. There's only one thing wrong with you, Eddie. You're bashful. I am neither bashful <laughs> nor Eddie. I am Edward. And if you value your position here, I caution you not to forget that. <laughs> What's the matter? You scared of me? For the last time... Who's that? Someone on the veranda. Open up in there. Rapping on the French window. Open up, I say. It's the law. Huh? It's Jimmy. Who? Jimmy, Officer Hurley. Oh, no. Rita. Rita, come here a moment. Yeah. Who's in there? Answer me. Open the door. One minute, officer. 
uh, Rita, maybe I was a little hasty. What? Try to get rid of him, will you? Rid of him? Yes, please. What are you, jealous? Yes, that's it. I'm jealous, very jealous. Eddie, this is very confusing. One minute you call me a thick head and say beat it. Yes, and then well, you... I, I was very confused for a while. <laughs> If you don't open up, I'm going to be forced to draw my service revolver. Just a minute. But I can explain everything if you just send him away. Well. I promise, just get rid of him. All right. I'll open the French window. Oh, good. Uh, just hold these portiers back out of your way. <laughs> Thank there. you, Edward. That's all right. Thank you. Oh, Jimmy. Hi, Rita Dad. Familiar. Oh, I see you're not alone. What's the idea, Hurley? Someone was skulking around your porch, and it's my duty to investigate all suspicious situations. Next time, don't kick in the window. The window is unarmed. What are you hanging on so tight to those rates for? Huh? Oh, <laughs> just holding them aside so you could pass. Well, now I pass so you can let go of them. Uh, yes, yeah, so I can. There. Uh, you mind your butlin' and be thankful I'm so alert. Well, you can see no one's come in here. I ain't seen nothing yet. Where's that door lead? Uh, to the hall. Yes, that's it, in the hall, the hall, out in the hall. What are you so jumpy about? <laughs> Me jumpy? Yeah, you, jumpy. I'm not jumpy. What's there to be jumpy about? <laughs> Listen to him, Rita. You think I was going to eat him up? Well, you've got a big enough mouth Shut for Shut up! Great help you'd be in the event of a felon. What about the rest of the house? What about it? Any unlocked portions? Windows? Doors? Uh, I'm not sure. That in that event, I'll have a look around. Oh, come to think of it, Hurley. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a basement room in the north wing, far end of the house. A window pane is broken. Window pane broken? That's right. Some safe guardian you are. We have official channels of information that a precious jewel is kept on the premises. What's that got to do with it? Do you have it under lock and key? Oh, sure, Jimmy. It's in the wall safe right there behind the curtain. Well, I'll just have a look. No! What? Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> Don't you hear something? Huh? I don't hear anything. Shh, it's a tinkling sound from the basement. A tinkling sound? Yes, like a window being broken. A window? Oh, my goodness. Raider, show me the way. Yeah. Oh. You with the mask. Yeah? They're gone. Come out from behind those drapes. Oh, pretty close, huh? Never mind about that. Put the box with the emerald in it on the sideboard. Then you can leave through here. Is that right? Don't you hear? Well, put down that box and get going. Twelve years sure ain't changed you much, have they, Eddie? What? Well, I take off this hanky. Remember me? Leroy. Uh-huh. Leroy, your old buddy. Only this time, I am gonna keep the loot. Leroy, pal, old pal. Why, for years I've looked and looked oh, and sure, looked. Oh, sure, you look real hard. You try eleven more. You mean prison all this time? You crummy double crosser. Ten years, don't give me looked and looked. But why? Chicago job, where's my end? Gone. You mean you were caught? Caught? The cops went crazy with me, but okay. This emerald makes it even. Leroy. Stand aside. Look, old pal, this hurts down deep. You're saying I ratted out. I say a lot more, but I'm in a hurry. Now move over. Now, wait a minute. Listen, you've been in stir. That's all very well. That's very tragic, Leroy, but what about me? What about you? I've been working for that bloodsucker. What, what, what bloodsucker? That one in the oil painting over the fireplace. For 12 years I've worked for him. Yeah? Yes, and let me tell you, there's no warden in the country that can touch him. Then why don't you quit? Because I stayed on to clean out his safe and no nickel anti chisel is going to do it for me. Oh, you're talking pretty tough, Eddie. And I'm feeling even tougher. You've been setting up a deal for ten years which you handed to the first clown who came along. Ten years? Old man Justin brought that emerald 18 months after I went to work here, and I've been trying for it ever since. You mean to tell me in ten years you couldn't crack that punk little safe? Safes aren't in my line. You know that. I work with my head. Besides, this one's unusually complicated. The tumblers... Complicated? Are very. It's a shoebox. Where are earmuffs? I could hear them tumblers drop. Ten years, big brain. Ooh. Leroy, I mean to have that emerald. Yes? Yes, hand it over. Or what? Or I call that flat foot back in here. Ain't you forgetting a few other flat foots? What do you mean? In Chicago, they still want you, Eddie. They want you bad. And if I go up again... All oh... right, all right, all right. We'll make a deal. What kind of deal? Fifty-fifty. I know a good fence in Milwaukee. You give me the stone, and I'll meet you there next Friday night, Schrader Hotel. <laughs> it's at least 50000 for us. I'll tell you. In Newark, there is a very fine fence. He will go 52. I will keep the stone and meet you there same day. Better let me take it. How do I know you show up? You sound like a cynic. Newark is closer all the way to Milwaukee. You might lose it. Leroy, listen. Wait a minute. Shh. What's Shh. the matter? What? Get behind those portiers. There's someone oh, coming. Okay. Be quiet. Be quiet. Oh, 
must be hearing things, losing my grip. I break into a cold sweat every time a board creaks. <laughs> Where's my handkerchief? What's this in my pocket? Oh, that document Leroy found on the floor, dropped out of the safe. Last will and testament of Jonathan Justin Esquire. Not very long. <laughs> Only three pages. Hey, Eddie. Stay where you are. Sounds like they're coming down the hall. Okay. Don't even peek out of the curtains. I'll tell you when it's all right. Okay, buddy. Last will and testament. I, Jonathan Justin, being of sound mind and body, I uh, wonder where the part is about the emerald. Nothing on page one. Page two. Charities, libraries. Here we are at the bottom of page two. I have sought long and tirelessly to decide who should be the recipient of my most cherished possession, the flawless, fabulous Contrelli emerald. Now we're getting there. Not Clarence, not Senator Winchester. Accordingly, I must search further for someone whose devotion and concern for my personal well-being has been long, unstinting, and for the most part, insufficiently rewarded. Such a person is my trusted manservant, Edward Hathaway. It would seem only fitting, therefore, that I repay this most nearly perfect of servitors for his years of faithful attention to me by bestowing upon him that jewel of jewels, the Contrelli Emerald. <laughs> End of page and paragraph. <laughs> me! It's me! Hey, what's the matter, Eddie? Stay behind the drapes, Leroy. Don't move. Okay. Me, Edward Hathaway. The will says he's going to give it to me. The emerald. My emerald. I'm trying to steal my emerald. Oh, this will never do. Leroy! Yeah? Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Oh, who, who was it? Nobody, nobody. It was nobody. Look, I just had an inspiration. Yeah? A way for both of us to cash in and neither of us has to trust the other guy. Yeah? But well, look now, here's the angle. Oh, I no. thought you said it was nobody. Oh, well, it was. <laughs> look, uh, back behind the curtain. I got rid of him, Eddie. You what? Officer Hurley, he's in the kitchen drinking coffee. Fine, go have a cup yourself. Well, weren't we gonna hold hands now? Get out! But you said... I that... said get out, out, out! What's going on here? If you're jealous, this is a funny way to show Jealous, it. you dumpy numbskull! What? <gasps> Stop howling and go answer the front door. Oh! Shut up! That's probably Mr. Clarence. Soon as you let him in, call the senator. He wants to begin reading the will at 9.45. Don't be sorry for this! And don't bring Mr. Clarence in here until the senator comes down. I want to tidy up. I'll marry Hurley and he'll tear you to pieces! Leroy! Hey, hey, what's that you said to her about a will? It's part of the deal. Now listen, we've only got a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Tonight, old man Justin's estate is being divided up. Who's is what? That guy up there in the picture. Oh. He died two days ago, and in a few minutes, they're coming in here to read in his here? will. In here? Well, what are we doing here? Let's... Stop chattering and listen to me. Almost everything in this estate, including the emerald, is sure to go to the old man's nephew, Clarence. Yeah. <laughs> That's who just rang the front doorbell. Mm. Now, look, here's the move. You can't be sure of me, and I can't be sure of you. Yeah, but I got the ice. Yes, and if I call the cops, you're a jailbird. You call the cops and I sing about Chicago. And neither of us gets the stone, which is poor business. Yeah, that's right. So we get around it this way. Yeah. You put the emerald and this document back in the safe and slam the door on it. Why should I do that? So that I'll open this French window and give you a clear field and the cops don't know anything. Uh, I don't like this so much. Once that safe's locked, you know I can't open it. I've been trying for ten years. Okay, okay. But what happens after I leave? Two days from now. I quit this job, meet you Friday evening, 9 p.m. in Newark, the subway terminal. And in a week, we both come back, grab the stone, and split even. Yeah. Hey, but what if this guy Clarence takes the stone away with him tonight, sticks it in the bank? Look, the emerald's uninsured. He'd be afraid to step out of the house with it. Oh. Don't you worry. <laughs> when we come back, it'll be here. Deal? Okay. Unlock the window. First, put the emerald in the safe. How do I know you'll unlock the window then? We'll do it together. I'll count three. Okay. One. I unlock the door. I pull back the curtain over the safe. Two. I put the box and the paper back in the safe. I turn the knob. Three. I swing the door open. I slam the safe shut. Get going. See you Friday, buddy. Friday. Oh, brother. Come in. 
Uh, Senator Winchester. Good. You know Officer Hurley? Yes. He sure does. And Rita, of course. Of, of course. course. Well, let's open the safe and see what old Jonathan has up his sleeve. All right, we'd wait for Mr. Clarence, sir. I'm afraid he won't be here, Edward. We just received a wire from him. He's not coming. Oh, who was that that rang the bell, Rita? Western Union. I guess it's just as well Clarence anticipated the futility of making the trip. Jonathan left him nothing. Never cared a straw for the boy. Ah, now. The will... And this little black box. Um, will you all make yourselves comfortable? Oh, thank yes, you, sir. Sit here, Senator, by the fire. Thank you, Edward. <laughs> uh, well, to begin. I, Jonathan Justin, being of sound mind and body and in full possession of my faculties, etc., etc., this first part simply disposes of the house and grounds, goes to the township with a substantial fund for their upkeep. Mr. Justin was always a generous man. Indeed, yes. indeed. Mm. Then there are several large bequests to various universities, and each of the servants is to receive a letter of recommendation from me, plus $210. Oh, isn't that nice, Jimmy? Wonderful, my dear, just one. Very generous, <laughs> indeed. Ah, here's a part of the will that will interest you. On page two... Yes. I have sought long and tirelessly to decide who shall be the recipient of my most cherished possession, the flawless, fabulous Cantrelli Emerald. Oh, yes, the Emerald. Uh, to continue, custom would normally dictate that such chattel pass to the sole lineal heir, or since no lineal heir exists, the ranking collateral heir. In this instance, my nephew Clarence. It's a shame he isn't here. A dirty shame, Rita. Uh, there is more, but my nephew Clarence is a nitwit. Oh. And I shall not bestow a treasure of such radiance upon a nitwit, lineal or otherwise. Who then? My dearest friend, Senator Hannibal Winchester. Uh, perhaps uh, Hannibal, too, would cherish this treasure as I have. Yes, and guard it wisely. He has been a trusted friend and a worthy colleague. Well, it couldn't have been given to a more deserving person, Senator. Uh, perhaps not, Edward, but Jonathan thought otherwise. Otherwise? As you shall see, to continue. But Senator Winchester is a man already richly endowed. He has worked well, but he has harvested bountifully. Bountifully enough. Then you don't get it either, sir? Uh, afraid not, Rita. Oh, that's a shame, isn't it, Jimmy? A dirty shame, Rita, dear. Uh, to continue. Accordingly, Hannibal writes, I must search further for someone whose devotion and concern for my personal well-being has been long, unstinting, and for the most part, insufficiently rewarded. Such a person is my trusted manservant, Edward Hathaway. Me? Why, it doesn't seem possible. It would seem only fitting, therefore, that I repay this most nearly perfect of servitors for his years of faithful attention to me by bestowing upon him that jewel of jewels, the contrary emerald. End of page two. Oh, I hardly know what to say. <laughs> this will make me well Page three. But I am a capricious old man. What? Given to mercurial changes of mind and heart. Changes? Let me finish, Edward. And for three years now, my days have been gladdened and my heart lightened by the presence in my home of a helpful, humble housemaid. Housemaid? Rita Berthe. Oh, no. Uh. And it is to her that I will my precious legacy... Oh, to, to me? I don't believe it. The Cantrellium. It's impossible. <laughs> How about that? Rita, you're a rich woman. But it was mine. I'm afraid not, Edward. Back there on page two, read that part again. I know. I felt it was mine on that page. Though. But it's back in the safe now. I put it... On... You put it back in no, the safe? No, I mean, it was always so safe in the safe. I watched out for it, the Emerald. That was my duty. Now, from now on, well, we'll leave you that burden, won't we, Rita, dear? <laughs> of course, Jimmy, but I can't believe it. Now, there's a ball down at Precinct Headquarters. We'll put it there. <laughs> Whatever you say, Jimmy. But wouldn't it be wiser to leave it here? Well, I don't know. After all, there has been a prowler on the premises this evening. Yes, but he's gone now. How do you know he's Well, gone? I mean, he's not here, is he? Anyone can see that. Even so, Edward, should he return by any chance and steal Rita's Emerald while it is still in our charge, I'd never forgive myself. No. Nor I, sir, nor Whereas I. Uh, once Officer Hurley deposits it in the police safe, there's not a chance in the world of its being stolen. I know. Rita, this treasure is yours. Oh, now, thank you again, sir. I'll phone down to police headquarters that Officer Hurley's escorting you there. Yes, sir. Come along, Rita, dear. You can stay at my Aunt Kate's tonight. <laughs> You're such a gentleman, Jimmy. <laughs> I and the boys will be over in the morning to pick up your stuff. Well... Is this to be a permanent change of address, Rita? Yes, sir. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations to both of you. I consider myself a very lucky man. A long life and a happy one, eh, Edward? I'm sure. Well, I'll see you to the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Edward, by the way. Yes, sir? I hadn't quite finished reading the will. Jonathan did leave you something, you know? He did? Oh, indeed. Something by which he set nearly as much store as the emerald itself. As the... as the emerald itself? Those were his very words. Well, well what is it? 
His portrait there over the fireplace. His portrait? I knew you'd be surprised. I think it's a rather amazing likeness myself. Rather interesting how it came to be painted. You see, Jonathan had a streak of vanity in him. Well, don't we all? But he saw no reason to let it carry him away. Well, this young fellow, the artist, came to the front door one day, offered to paint an oil portrait of Jonathan for $50. Jonathan finally got him down to 35 for the frame alone. <laughs> This is Rosalind Russell again. Do you remember The Vision of Sir Launfall by James Russell Lowell? How Sir Launfall, the proud, arrogant young knight, rode forth in search of the Holy Grail? And as he rode forth, he saw a leper at the gate of the castle and tossed him a piece of gold in scorn. But because of that selfishness, he searched in vain for the Holy Grail. Years later, he returned, an old, bent man, worn out and frail. He found a stranger in his castle and his own gate locked against him. As he sat shivering in the snow, a leper crept up and whispered, For the sake of our Lord, I beg an alms. Sir Launfal, no longer proud or arrogant, but humble and understanding, looked up and saw a fellow creature who needed help. And he shared his one crust of bread and gave the leper a drink of water from his wooden bowl. Then a great miracle came to pass. The leper no longer crouched at his side, but stood before him glorified. And the voice that was calmer than silence said, Lo, it is I, be not afraid. In many climes without avail, Thou hast spent thy life for the Holy Grail. Behold, it is here, This cup which thou didst fill at the streamlet for me but now. This crust is my body, broken for thee. This water, his blood that died on the tree. The Holy Supper is kept indeed, In whatso we share with another's need. Not what we give, but what we share, for the gift without the giver is bare. Who gives himself with his alms feeds three, himself, his hungering neighbor, and me. That is Christian charity, the charity that can make this a better world to live in. Thank you for being with us, and remember, the family that prays together stays together. More things are up by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Where There's a Will, starring Vincent Price. Rosalind Russell was your hostess. Others in our cast were Vivi Janis, Ted DeCorsia, Jack Crucian, and Herb Butterfield. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our Family Theater stage. To them, and to you, our humble thanks. This is Larry Chatterton expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us again next week when Family Theater will present Clean and Crisp and Even, starring Jeff Chandler and George Murphy. Join us, won't you? And now we suggest you stay tuned for John Holbrook and the latest news on the newspaper of the air, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.